<laughs> when Noel mentioned my name earlier, he called me Danny Carroll, and that's my name, but it's only part of my name. I'm Danny Carroll Rodas. I'm an Old Testament prophet at Denver Seminary. But more importantly, I'm half Guatemalan. I'm the son of a Guatemalan mother and American father, and I'm probably the tallest Guatemalan in the history of the world. <laughs> but I spent a lot of time there growing up, and I taught there for about 13 years before moving to Denver to teach the Old Testament. I still go there. I'm an adjunct there at the seminary in Guatemala City. And so in estas venas fluye sangre guatemalteca. In this, in this body flows Guatemalan blood. <laughs> But when I came back to the States a number of years ago, one of the things that disturbed me as I moved into the immigration piece was that it never was a Christian conversation. It was about all these other things. And even among the Christian churches, it wasn't what I would have hoped. I go to a Hispanic church, Iglesia El Camino, in Aurora, Colorado, and I began to see the need to speak out Por mi gente, for my people. We need to have this conversation. We need to begin to talk about immigration. But when we talk about immigration, it's not an easy conversation. It's a difficult one. Not only outside the church, but in the church. And if you've had those conversations, you know what I'm talking about. This morning I want to show you two pictures and I want to give you two questions to think about. I don't know if the, the pictures can come on the screen. If not, I'll just continue. We don't, ah, oh, there we go, but we went too fast. You went by the pictures. Back up. Can you back up there? Look at that picture. See Uncle Sam at the gate. You see the immigrant trying to get in, and Uncle Sam holding his nose. This was from the 1890s. <laughs> and this immigrant has anarchy in his baggage and poverty in his baggage. Does that sound familiar? The one thing we don't have today that we have in that picture is he's got a barrel on his back that says Sabbath desecration. And it's strong drink. In fact, by that barrel, if you were to get real close, there's a cup. The next picture is from the other coast. It's from the 1880s, and it's about keeping the Chinese out of this country. See, there's too many in California. Isn't it ironic that this 1880 cartoon has a wall? See, that's the solution, isn't it? A build a wall and throw the ladder down and don't let them in. See, this isn't a new problem. We've been having the problem with immigration since the founding of the Republic. It's always been a hard conversation, even with the myth of the melting pot. So here are my two questions. The first question is this. Where do we begin the conversation? Do we begin it with statistics? Is that where we begin the conversation? Well, that really won't get very far because we just start throwing numbers at each other. Do we begin it at the wall? And it's all about national security. Drugs and gangs and terrorists sneaking their way across tunnels in the border. Is that where you begin the conversation or do we begin it with the Bible? And that's my challenge to you. So you begin the conversation in the Bible. But the problem is where in the Bible? We'll get to that in just a moment. But for whom? You see, as we move to the Bible about the immigration debate, there's several different audiences that we speak to. There is the audience that doesn't know anything about immigration, and we need to instruct them, and the Bible is full of stuff about immigration. That's the majority culture that needs to hear God's heart for the immigrant. But there's also another audience. This is the audience that are the immigrants themselves. They begin to see and they discover in the Bible that God walks with them. Dios nos acompaña en el camino. God walks with us in our journey. And so we bring the Bible to all of these audiences. And we begin the conversation at the beginning. 
with the image of God. See, we know this idea generally from, from Christian teaching that because we're made in the image of God, we all have value in the sight of God. That we are of infinite worth, and this is why God sent his son to die for us and to offer us salvation. But if you go to the passage, if you really look at the passage in Genesis 1, when he talks about being made in the image of God, male and female, he says we are made in the image of God to rule the earth and to subdue it. We are to represent him on the earth as his sub-regents. We are to be the representatives of the king on earth. Now put that into the immigrant discussion. See, it's not only, you see, that, that immigrants have worth and value, which they do. They are representatives of the king. They too can rule and subdue the earth. It's not only talking about how they have value, it's talking about how they have potential for the country. They're not a burden anymore. See, now we have to ask, what can they bring? How can we facilitate this? How can we channel all of this energy, all the things that they can bring to the country? And we begin to change the tone of the conversation. We begin to change the focus of the conversation. We begin to change the direction of the conversation. They are God's gift to us, and they bring potential into the country. They're not a burden anymore. If we begin at the beginning, so that's the first thing I would challenge you with in terms of a question. If you're willing to enter into the conversation, which is not gonna be an easy one, and if you've been in those conversations, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Where do we begin it? As Christians, we begin it here. Page one, Genesis one. Second question, this is the harder question. Who are we in the conversation? Because this is what it gets down to for many people. And even if you talk to Christians who are against this whole immigrant thing, they'll take you to the Bible. They'll take you to Romans 13. Now they'll talk about how we're supposed to obey the government. But see, then we have to ask the bigger question. It's the most uncomfortable question many times for the people we talk with. Where is our ultimate loyalty? Where is our true citizenship? Are we Americans first or Christians first? That's the question. We can be good citizens, but we're loyal brothers and sisters. We have a different compass. We have a different king. We have a different constitution. We are Christians first, and we are Americans second. That's the hard discussion with people. Because sometimes when you scratch the surface, when push comes to shove, it's not, you see, the Christian skin, it's the American skin. The skin that's forgotten all of the stories of the past. The skin that wants to build walls and keep people out to divide families and to persecute and criminalize people. Is that where our heart is, really? I would hope not. And even when we go to Romans 13, and you have to get there, I mean, it's in the Bible. <laughs> even that's not the place to begin. We begin our conversation in Romans 12. That's where we find ourselves, is in Romans 12. And if you know Romans 12, and I assume it's CCDA that you know these things. If not, John will be deeply disappointed. See, don't let the world mold you. Don't be conformed to the world. And when I've been in churches and I've heard sermons on that, it's all about uh, materialism and 
a sexual license or, or things like that, and that, that's helpful. But if you read the passage, the passage doesn't talk about those things. I keep on reading past verses 1 and 2. And it talks about God has given the church and everyone in it gifts to serve others. The world will tell us to be number one. The world will tell us to make it to the top. That's being conformed to the world. Even in our ministries we see that. The ambition to be the best and the biggest. But no, we are given these things to serve. And he keeps going, Paul does, in that chapter 12, about being peace, at peace with all people as much as you are able. Does that sound like criminalizing populations? And then he says something that digs even deeper. He says, if your enemy is hungry, you give them something to eat. If your enemy is thirsty, you give your enemy something to drink. See, how far away is that from criminalizing a population? You see, because as Christians, we have to realize that even if you think that the immigrants are your enemies, you feed them. And even if you think they're invading us and taking us over, if that's what you want to think, even if they are your enemies, you give them something to drink. As Christians, we have no excuse. Let, let the, the nation and let the government bear the sword, as it says in Romans 13. We bear the cross, for goodness sakes. And we have a different set of values. And we find our life as we give it away. We find our life as we lay it down for others. We find our life as we walk with others on this journey. I can submit to the government, and it says submit. It doesn't say to obey. And the other thing is, oftentimes when people give me that line from Romans 13, the assumption is that the law is good. Well, they don't know immigration law. That's why we have elections in this country. And we're trying to change the law all the time. That's why we have November coming up. That's why we have petitions, because we're constantly trying to change bad laws, and for goodness sakes, let's change this bad law. And do it as Christians, with that kind of commitment and based on the Word of God. The Bible is full of things about immigration. The stories in the Bible, the laws of Moses, the prophets demanding justice for the foreigner, the hope for a different future where the foreigner is part of the body of Israel and the people of God, the gospels where Jesus will be with those who no one else wants, the church that incorporates all these different colors and all these different people, this is the basis of our talking about immigration. There is so much in the Bible about immigration. My time is coming to a close. But please, please, please hear the heart of God. But have an informed heart. Go to the scriptures, as John was saying. Let this be the foundation. There is so much here. Once we see this, then we can understand why we need to get involved in immigration. The cross, my friends, that is the basis of all we do. I've written a book on immigration. It may be on the screen, I don't know. But hopefully if you read something like that, and there's others out there, you begin to see the breadth of all that God has to say about this. May God bless you, and may he guide you in this. Let's pray. Oh, Padre nuestro que estás en los cielos, santificado sea tu nombre. Oh, God, please help us move forward on this. May we speak truth prophetically. May we speak truth 
lovingly. May we be the voice of Jesus Christ in the immigration debate that's going to be hard and the road will be long. May we be loyal, faithful followers of our Savior. We ask this in his name. Amen.